Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and talking about training transfer with Stefan Jones. Guys, after a quick little rundown of what Stefan's got going on across the pond. He's going to get right into it. He's going to dive into training and how his role as an athlete growing up really provided him with the mindset to expand and look to drive what he's doing today. Uh, he runs down a rabbit hole talking about you know the bowlers that he gets to work with for cricket and, and what they look at. What are their KPIs? How does he evaluate them? What's uh, what he's measuring when it comes to jumps and throws with different implements uh, and things of that nature. And then we get into talking about data-driven uh, game statistics and how looking at how the athletes move in competition is impacting how he's looking at things and changing how he uh, works with the athletes. We finish off, guys, talking about the role of the aerobic system and, and how it just seems that there are so many things that are just tried and true and have been done for a long time and they seem to continue to work. Imagine that. Uh, but guys, seriously, this is really an awesome talk. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Stefan, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, excited. Excited to be involved. Uh, I've uh, listened to, to a few of your podcasts and they, um, yeah, cool. Nice to be here. Oh, well, oh, listen, man, I'm sorry up for this because we were just talking a little bit off camera about some, some pretty cool stuff. And I, I think that first and foremost... A little bit of background as to you know what you're doing and, and your setup right now because I think that's pretty unique and is going to open up some doors for us to talk about some more things as we get moving forward. Yeah, definitely. So um, I was a professional uh, athlete for 20 years, so I was the last person to play two professional sports in the UK. So I was a professional rugby player, and then I retired after maybe two years of doing that because it was too uh, too much hard work. Uh, and then I was a professional cricketer for a, another 15 years. So about 20 years in general from the, my first contract. Uh, so And then I retired in 2010. 
Uh, you know, I played the age group na- international rugby and cricket. So I, I did like I was a poster boy for for a pathway. I went from the start to to the top, and uh, hard work was my uh, point of difference. Um, and I tried every training method going because back when I started, the physiotherapist did your training program. Um, but then, so I tried everything. And, and I was big on, I want my own responsibility. So if I fail, it's my own fault. So no disrespect to you, strength and conditioning coach or physio. You know, I want to live and die by the sword, really. So I tried every training method going. And now I'm... Um, I'm finding out interesting things, uh, being a coach on uh, going back on my experiences as a player of what worked and what didn't work, which is why I get passionate about a, a lot of different things. Uh, and a big thing at the minute, it's for me, is not the, the over-focus on some on strength training and heavy weight training. And, I, and I'm... Uh, I've gone down a different route, and and this is for fast bowling. You know, fast bowling, that occurs. Your back foot contact is 0.12 seconds. Your front foot, when it lands, it's like a javelin, and it's like a pitching. It's like a pitcher, but with a run-up. So it's all about stiffness. It's all about short ground contact times, but maximum force. So it's um, it's a unique sport unique skill in a very unique sport you know you americans can't quite grasp it because we could play for five days and nobody wins what's that about yeah i you're right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it is bizarre and then so i retired and now i'm director of sport at uh, at a private school um you pay fees so it's it is a unique uh uh, direction I've taken and then in my school holidays and my own time I then coach so I'm a professional coach I run my own business called Pace Lab uh, I've also got another one called Cricket Strength so we design programs for cricketers fast bowlers around the world and then I travel coaching fast bowlers so I just come back from the IPL which is the India Premier League which is the number one cricket tournament it's like your Super Bowl, but non-stop for eight weeks. It's that high profile because India is a crazy country. It's awesome. I love it. And that's, uh, I, there's one rabbit hole we got to run down because we were just talking a little bit before. And, and then obviously I'm going to talk about what was going on at the IPL because there's some crazy stuff to get into with that. But there seems to be this ongoing theme from people when it comes to working with speed athletes that maybe that whole idea of massive lifting numbers isn't better. Yeah. This is something that, so this will probably be episode 189 or 190. That's probably popped up on a third of these. Okay. Let's run down that rabbit hole. What are you yeah. seeing, especially with your bowlers? What, what stuff are you seeing right now, mechanically, you know, with what they're doing? And, and what are some things that you're seeing that are having positive outcomes and some things that you're seeing that are having negative outcomes? Yeah, great question. So going back to my, you know, myself as a player. Uh, so I was a rugby player, so it's all about mass or so force. It was mass times acceleration. Mass was a big, big part of it, you know. So, but that doesn't need to happen in, in fast bowling in cricket. But so I lifted silly tin, you know, silly amount of weights. So maybe not your know, American football sort of numbers, but I was deadlifting 200 kilograms with chains, bench pressing 150. Uh, I could do 70 kilogram pull-ups for five reps, power clean 120, snatch 90. So I've done it. So when someone says to me, yeah, but you weren't strong, there's no one on this earth playing cricket that would be as strong as I was. That is because that's what that's what I was. That's what I was wired to do. I loved it. I loved being stronger than any other bowler in the world. I tr- I trained myself to be faster. But my career was a great case study of training methods that transferred, training methods that worked. 
So I was a small rugby player, and you wouldn't believe it now looking at me, but <laughs> I'm getting older. Um, I was a small, so the coach said, um, get stronger, get bigger, put muscle on. And I was, well, I can't do that because to bowl fast, you shouldn't lift weights because it gets you bulkier. You know, this was the end of the 80s, early 90s. And then I got stronger to to keep the rugby player coach happy and I bowled faster. I thought, oh, flip a minute, that's awesome. I'll keep doing that. So I kept doing the weights and kept getting stronger. And there, there came a point where I didn't bowl quicker. It, there was uh, there was a ceiling. So I needed another another stimulus. Um, so what happened then? I, I stumbled on some bondage stuff, special strength, and big on overloaded skill work. So heavy ball bowling, lots of medicine ball throwing, lots of sprinting. Uh, you know, I've done everything. I've pushed a car, I've pushed a prowler, I've pushed a parachute, and all this stuff that I'm seeing out now with these new coaches who are going, have you tried this method? And this is, I'm like, man. I did that 30 years ago. Seriously, you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and then I bowled quicker again. Um, so every every step I took, it was about bowling faster. Uh, and that's where I lie now as a coach. You know, 80 miles per hour now is the new 90. So basically, um, people are running faster in other sports. People, you know, the the 40 meter dash in NFL is, is just crazy. Um, whether it makes them a, a better running back or quarterback is another issue, but you guys can debate that. But it, And then people are throwing the javelin further, pitching faster, you know, 100, meet, 100 mile per hour pitch, well, 95 miles per hour, which is 150 odd kilometers, is standard now. You know, you need to be doing that. But in cricket, we're bowling slower. We are bowling slower, and and the modern day bowler or coach can disagree with it. But I've played in the older era, and I'm now coaching in in the new era. And it's fact the bowlers are not as bowling as quick as they used to. However, there are better athletes. They are far better athletes in this modern day than they were uh, 20, 30 years ago. So we are better athletes, which, as you know, is developed in the gym, strength, conditioning, power, force works, uh, speed work. But why is that not transferring to bowling that ball quicker? And that is my big thing at the minute. That's my question to the cricket community. So all that work you're doing on a squat poundage, yes, they're, they're massive numbers, but that kid is not bowling any quicker on the field. What what? And that's why you're training, isn't it? Surely to make him his own field performance is better. And so this year, as you can probably tell, it's a it's a big thing for me. It's, <laughs> it, I, I've gone down this route, and uh, I'm pretty confident of where I am at the minute. Um, so this year at school, we had a bowler turn up who was uh, 58 kilograms. So that's probably the weight of one of my legs. But he bowled, he bowled 85 miles per hour as an 18-year-old. And I was looking at him going, mate, what's, what's happening here? I'm looking at this in the wrong way. Uh, and then there's a boy next to him who's, who's stacked, big, large, sort of. Again, I, I do neurotyping as well. So I would class as a neurotype 2, uh, neurotype 2B, love the bodybuilding stuff, love the feel of the pump and that. And that's why um, he lifted weights. Um, so what I came up with then, doing lots of research and experimenting, I categorized bowlers into two uh, two dominants now, so you're a hip dominant bowler or you're a knee dominant bowler, and that's based on the angle of the back leg as it lands, um, and it, and it works, you know, and it's worked, and the cricket world has has gone with it, um, and uh, lots of javelin throwers, pitching coaches are now asking questions, and might be going over to the Astros and the Angels to, to present some of my ideologies and. When you identify then whether the hip or knee, you can then tailor your program to, to their needs. And it's also 
uh, it's based on the the static spring continuum where they where they sit on that so and the problem is in cricket everyone is doing strength everyone is doing weight training well actually they may need to go they're, they're all right they're strong enough you know they can they can squat 100 kilograms which which is fine they weigh 58 kilograms they need to go to the other end of that continuum let's do some jumps you know i split my days into a force jump day a, a, a speed jump day and a stiffness jump day where they do some pogo jumps and um and it's working you know it's they put on four miles per hour in in a 24 week um periodized plan so that's why i i'm i'm confident that that this is the right way every bowler is different and it's just identifying their needs and then not having a cookie cutter program for them all um, some might need not need to squat others might need to squat so it's individual needs come first so then when you look at that excuse me how are you identifying what their needs are and is this a situation where you're saying we're working at deficiencies or we're working at expanding on what these athletes do best so an elastic athlete is doing more of the pogo jumps as opposed to more of the strength training or vice versa because the elastic athlete typically is not as good with the weight room yeah and how much input do the bowlers have in what's going on with that yeah another good question so i profile so i profile my fast bowlers the and, and it and it's a, a lot of a uh, lot of numbers uh, my big thing is assess don't guess so i know their their counter movement jumps compared to their squat jumps i know their depth jumps so i know uh, you know their rsi whether they're strong whether they're stronger at the long longer stretch shortening or the stretch shorter stretch shortening because fast bowling is about the short stretch the fast short short stretch shortening cycle um their balls ball velocity i test their ball velocities on different weighted balls so if they're uh, i'd be able to see then the discrepancies you know do they bowl the heavy ball faster than than their normal ball so then that tells me you know strength is not a limiting factor for them they need to go the other end so i'm bowl more um lighter balls so it is a balance of both so in simple answer to your question it's a 70 30 split for me 70 percent works on their limiting factor 30 percent would work on their uh, just keep pushing that uh, their strengths and that strength might be they're more tendon driven so do more isometric work i i, I live on isometric work if you saw me coach someone very very rarely would i do a, just a barbell concentric work you know i've got some nice tools i do lots of eccentric uh, work whether that's on the flywheel uh, i do lots of shock training uh, you know db hammer stuff i i loved his work and i'm going back to it now lots of auto regulation i took that to the ipl you know my first session in the ipl every bowler bowled 24 balls and I speed gun it. So that was their max. So I said, you have to bowl as fast as you gun for 24 balls. So I know then that's their, you know, that's where they are neurally. That's CNS, max intensity day. And then from there, I'd work off the drop-offs. So 1.5% drop-off is one day recovery. So I'd make sure that even though they'll bowl the next day, they have to bowl four slower balls. So that takes me down to the 80% mark, and then they can bowl every day. They can do a skill every day, but it's you can't bowl flat out every day. So it, it is a very, very unique sport because fast bowling is uh, there's ten times, eight to ten times your body weight of force on the front leg on contact, and between four to five on the back foot that's a lot of force going through your legs so you're telling me i weigh 100 kilograms that i have to single leg squat 800 kilograms it, no it doesn't work like that no and i love that, that I, 
so much that we could run around with that. Because it's, it's, it's funny, that's kind of been like one of the calling cards for, for us, right? For strength coaches is that, yeah. yeah, you know, sprinting is X times body weight, so you need to be super strong, and that's why you got to be able to squat at house. And, but it's not the same. No, no it's not. It's not, not, not remotely. No, it's not because for for so I say eight to ten eight to ten times your body weight on front foot contact, but that lasts 0.5 seconds. So well, we know that the stretch shortening cycle is between 0.25 and 0.5, isn't it? So it's actually strength does not have a massive role to play. Yes, it has a role to play because. It, it, it does underpin power, which subsequently underpins speed. Yes, I get all that. But it's what you need as, as a fast bowler. It's what you need. You, you might need to get stronger. But that's why profile is, profiling is important. And remember, this does depend on training age as well. Every child I get would, you know, would goblet squat, would press up, would pull up and Yada yada yeah that, that's that's a given. I don't I don't market myself and sell myself on that because well that's a given surely you, you know <laughs> that's physical literacy. You need to be physically literate to bowl a cricket ball. But then there's a cutoff point. You know there there is a cutoff point and people uh, forget that and they don't bowl enough. I, I, honestly, you'd be um, you'd be amazed at some of the stuff that goes on. For example, cricket. And again, it's another frustration of mine. Cricket, you'd have six months off season. Six months. So there's no excuse why a fast bowler shouldn't be bowling four miles per hour quicker than they were the year before. There's no excuse. That doesn't happen in rugby, NFL, anything else. You know, you have a six, eight weeks uh, off season, which you, your only option is either complex training or conjugate. That's it. Because you haven't got, you can't do block training. You can't do block training uh, in any other sport, I would suggest, but you can in cricket. You can in cricket. So why are bowlers, why aren't they bowling faster? It's so an off season. So you finish your season September. Um, I only had a week off, but most would have a month where they don't do anything. They do very little. And then they would, they would bowl come next March, like, uh, three weeks before the season start, and that's just madness. So a sprint, a sprinter would would sprint all off season every time. The only thing that varies is the type of sprinting they do, whether it's tempo running or. But they always run. But for a bowler, a bowler stops doing the skill that they get paid for for four months, and is is that not lunacy? <laughs> That's like telling me that Prince would put down the guitar until a week before his tour. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm thought of it like that. It is. It's just madness. And, and that practice goes on at the very top. Well, and, you know, I hate to say it like this, but we might kind of be to blame for that, right? Like, yeah. we sit there and we say, oh, you got to get away. You got to get away. You got to get away. But this is another constant theme that seems to be popping up with coaches and that's like the better you get the more you have to work on your skill absolutely and it's like yeah like you know a good friend of ours Kier when i'm flat yeah he's always good always makes the joke like you you don't turn into a concert pianist by practicing the tuba right like <laughs> like i get it and you're a, i couldn't agree more where you're talking about there's the physical literacy with the younger athletes who haven't trained and yeah, like that's probably like the strength coach claim to fame, right? Is that like when you get new kids and you just do simple, basic, general, you know, yep. simple overload, linear periodization, they get stronger and they get better at things, but then there's a the cutoff. And yep. we all run away from the fact that, you know, maybe LeBron does need to spend more time on the court in the off season than yep. in the weight room. Because yeah. he gets paid a trillion dollars to play basketball, yeah. not to squat with bands. Yeah, that's so. The problem is, and I, I can't comment about other sports. Although Kevin and Flat is a good friend of mine, he's a, he's a great, great man. 
Uh, we're very similar, actually. We shoot from the hip on most things, which gets us into trouble. But when we find the right environment, we work well. Um, is that S and C's get judged? I call it the whiteboard syndrome. They get judged on the numbers on the whiteboard. Uh, my guy two weeks ago was lifting 110 bench. Now he's lifting 120. I must be awesome with such an ego-driven sport because it's visual for everyone and the, and the improvements uh, everyone can see. Well, actually, the question you should ask is by, by lifting 20 kilograms more, it, are they now improved their performance on the field, which they're paid to do? That's what, uh, that's what concerns me, that actually um, until S&Cs are, are judged uh, and I clear myself in that. I, I judged on match day performances. The, the practice will continue because, well, their their KPI is making them stronger, faster in, in a test. You know, pre-season. Wow, look, so and so is running uh, a 40 meters half a second faster. I must be awesome. But can they bowl quicker? So for me, my KPI is always the speed gun. Every session I do, I speed gun my bowlers. Whatever, if that's his 11 year old girl at school here, or Jofra Archer, or Shane Thomas, Varan Aaron, Sean Tate, these guys, Ishan Shama, these guys who I've coached, it's always the speed gun. And velocity can be increased. Obviously, the higher up you get in, that, in the pathway, they're nearing the top of their ceiling. They're nearing the, their limit. You know, I, I think you're born to bowl quickly. It's in your DNA. It's in your genes. Um, but everyone, everyone starts at a different level. So what I say, I get so many questions. <laughs> it's quite, quite annoying. They go, um, I want to bowl 140, which is the be benchmark, which is, the, which is like fast bowling. And I say, what pace do you bowl now? 120. How old are you? I'm 28. And I'm going, oh, do you want me to be honest or do you want me to sell a program to you? Because uh, honestly, no, it's not happening. But I can tell you, you can go to 125 by training properly. So ev so there's a that's their pace floor. Everyone has a pace floor, but nobody's pushing that pace ceiling up yet. And pace ceiling will be pushed up by correct training for their dominance for their fiber makeup, for their neurotyping, for where they lie in the static spring. Are they tendon driven? Are they muscle driven? Are they hip or knee dominant? But somebody's floor will be at a higher level that you start. Genes will give you your P pace floor. And it's just getting into that, into that mindset that um, some might never ever bowl quickly. Not everyone will run sep 10 and 100 meters. But everyone can improve on what they currently have by training properly, recovering properly, um, you know, all those sort of stuff. Yeah, and now with more and more of these in-game metrics being available, I mean, they're still excessively expensive for team sports with things like GPS and stuff like that. Actually understanding, you know, like, are they faster in the match and not just with the stopwatch or with the timing gates? Yeah. Are they able to hit more? high speed meters and more high speed bouts over X distances and are their X cells and D cells better? Like those are now measurable. So in game statistics more so I think, and this is just, and I've been kind of preaching about this for a while to people like that needs to be more of where our evaluation comes through. Like it's really cool. Oh, you put three inches on somebody's vertical. Congratulations. Yeah. But, at the end of the day, the goal in basketball is still 10 feet high. Like, is that going to be, like, that much of a difference? Yeah. You know? So, it's so we actually, with the Rajasthan Royals, we had catapult. So, we had GPS. And it was it was great for me. So, um, how I did it. So, because I was their S&C coach as well as the fast bowling. Uh, I call, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with James Smith. Uh, so, it's governing dynamics of coaching. Uh, and... That is big for me, having the knowledge to have an impact on whatever, whether that's technical, physical, tactical, or psychological, is having the knowledge to have an impact. 
You don't have to be a master in each one. I'm trying to be, uh, but you need to know why a bowler can't bowl straight. Is it because they have dysfunction on their left glute? Is it not firing or anything like that? Or eccentrically, are they are they weak or um, anything like that? So you need you need an impact. So for the first two weeks in the IPL, this current one. Uh, so I was more of an S and C. So I had I measure I they all had GPS. So at the evening of every training a game, I would sit down and look at their bands, look at their velocity bands, and it really is uh, interesting. I'm looking at the data now that very very, and I'm talking good athletes. Very few athletes get in the top band that they would sprint in. So in, in a cricket game, so this was 2020, so it would last 90 minutes each, three hours. Um, I had two two people run in a whole eight weeks. I'm looking at it now. Actually, four people, four bowlers, batters, whatever, ran faster than 30, so 30 kilometers per hour. So what's that? That's 10 meters per second, isn't it? So that was it. So why are we spending all that time doing speed work when they don't do it in the game? That is the question I ask myself because most of the bands are actually, um, I've just put it on uh, Instagram now. So they in eight weeks, they covered 88 Ks in the game between 88 and 55 Ks. That's a lot. So what's that? That's like... 10, 10 Ks a week. Most of that was in Bande, which is below 20. So that's that's tempo running. That's jogging, isn't it? That's so so we we spend lots of time training in band three, which is 25 or 30 kilometers per hour and above, which is highly neural, highly stressful. The, the the potential for hamstring strains and that sort of stuff is very high, which then would limit the amount of time they can practice and do their skill work when actually they probably won't hit that in their game. So that is the question I asked when I was out there. But actually, the other side of me was like, yeah, but the impact that having that highly neural training methods has on everything else is massive. So it potentiates everything and it will push the threshold for the other two bands higher and it's um, hamstring resilience and, and all that. So I get it, but I did actually looking at the numbers question. So why am I doing that method? Why am I pulling them on a 1080 sprint <laughs> above the 10 meters per second to so assisted work? Well, actually, they will never hit that in a game. The game itself doesn't allow that to happen. So a fast so bowling fast bowling is it's all about manipulating forces and talk is a big thing about it and hip shoulder separation uh, is about so i split into three things momentum from your run up so your approach speed is key they need to run in between uh, 7 and 8 meters per second i believe and hit and then you got rotation talk at the crease so that is uh, well, before that, you get the jump and then you get the delivery. So in all that, you've got uh, momentum, acceleration, uh, negative uh, and positive acceleration, uh, torque, impulse. All of that is going on when you bowl one delivery. So I break them then into each day. So I have a approach day. I have a jump day. Uh, which is back foot and front foot contact. And then I have a delivery, which is lots of rotation, weighted ball bowling. I do exogen, which is uh, it's like an internal mechanical load in. So it's a, it's a suit, which I see some of the sprinters using it now, that uh, it goes on the surface of the muscle and your muscle, uh, because it's uh, the muscle sees it as, it's part of the muscle in simple terms. It's not an, a, like a weighted vest or that sort of stuff. So um, so the numbers are really eye-opening for me in the IPL, and it has sort of uh, put me in a different direction with my training in terms of 
energy system work. And that's why I put this latest Instagram post on. It's, you know, oxidative system, man, it's it's important. <laughs> and uh, athletes, we don't run enough. You know, we don't run enough. And, I, and I, you might disagree, but sorry, sitting on a bike, sitting on a bike is not cutting it for me. Oxidative work, energy system work is really specific as well. You have to do what your skill is. So you get running, man. You know, there's a reason why, surely, I might be saying a bit simply, you know, but Muhammad Ali used to run a lot and boxers still run a lot. So there's, there's, if they were, if it didn't work, then I'm sure those guys wouldn't be doing it. So I just think that the oxidative system is, is underused in a lot of sports these days. Hank Krajenhoff has said it best. There's a reason things stick around because they work. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, but no, and I couldn't agree more. And it's the whole idea of specific adaptations to impose demands, right? Yeah. Like, isn't that like lesson one for what we do? And one of those things we talk about, like you do what the game demands and you get better at doing that more and more and more and you should get better at the game. Yeah, but you think so, didn't you? So but why why does why is the practice of and i see it uh, i don't offend anyone but i don't care really but it, i see these gyms in america these university gyms where you got the s and c shouting at them to lift a heavy weight where their form is shocking the like the stress on the knees and the lower back is shocking why does that practice still go on when actually you know we know that it doesn't transfer to to sports performance, so why why are they still going? I just don't can't work it out. You know, it's because that's the way it's always been done. Yeah, it's just really bizarre. I find it I find it bizarre that as an athlete, I want the coach to make me a fa better fast bowler. Uh, and it, to be fair, uh, and that's why I think I've got a lot of people listen now because I was that I, I was that guy in cricket. I was that freak who would deadlift 200 with th four chains on and I would do, why aren't you doing this? It's all about strength. It's all about improving your numbers. And then there was this eureka moment for me last year where my fastest bowler that I've seen at 18 years of age weighed 58 kilograms, couldn't, couldn't squat 50 kilograms, couldn't bench 20 kilograms, but picked the ball up and bowled rockets. And now I'm thinking, I'm missing something here. But he's really tendon-driven. It, it's it's frightening how tendon-driven he is. And that's why, I, first thing I do, I look at their bowling action. I look at their skill, and I see what their body currently wants to do. The, but the body will bowl a ball the way it wants to go. It's nobody's taught, nobody's taught them to do that. If I give someone a ball... They will bowl the ball where their body wants to move, whether it's dysfunction in certain in certain parts or where they're stronger in other parts. And then my my job is to look at it and go, is that safe? Is that efficient? Is it effective? If it is, if I'm ticking those boxes, I'll go right. I'll work with what I got technically. And they'll get you stronger, more powerful, whatever, isometrics, eccentrics, weighted ball. I've tried EMS, you know, tried a method a few weeks ago where I had the EMS on the calf muscle while holding an overcoming isometric. So it's all tendon. It's all about uh, tendon stiffness. And we know that in tendon hypertrophy will increase the, the stiffness on it as well. So it's... I've tried all the methods, all the methods going, and and the key point that I've come to is, funny enough, everyone is different. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, everyone is different. What works for one will be the enemy of another one. I love it. Well, listen, Stefan, let me get you out of here on this. Where can people see more of what you're doing? Because you're putting some stuff up right now that is... Uh... It's very mind driving, thought provoking. Yeah. Where yeah. can they see more? Where can they learn more? And where can they follow you better around? Yeah. So a big thing for me is my, is my Instagram. 
Uh, is Stefan Jones 105? That is the main thing. You know, I have a job. I'm director of sport at a school, so I, I my bills are paid for. So my coaching is about sharing my knowledge, sharing the 30 years of playing and reading. I've got all the books going. I've gone to loads of seminars, you know. Uh, I have good friends with a lot of people, Thibodeau, uh, Just Fly, Joel Smith, I know a lot of these guys, and I share my knowledge. What is knowledge if you don't share it? There's no point being the most intelligent boy in your own in your own brain, is that you've got you got to share the knowledge. So, uh, Instagram will they will get everything, and then I've got uh, cricketstrength.com. I run it with a good friend of mine, Ross Stewart. Um, I do some stuff on there, but it's it's all mainly Instagram, and I will share everything that comes into my head in the morning. And I'll share it, and I, and then it's open for discussion. I'm not saying everything I do is right, but let's share ideas. It, it's a coaching community. No, nobody has a right to keep on to a certain information. It's like we're there to coach and help people. It's not about us as coaches. It is not about us. That's and I think that that's that gets lost in the coaching community, whether that's technical, tactical, or s and It really isn't about us. The guys the guys who go on the field and put their body on the line, those are the ones that count, and we need to help them get better. 1,000%. Well, Stefan, I cannot thank you enough for your time today. This is absolutely sensational, brother. Thank you so much. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Yeah. Absolute pleasure. Well, listen, buddy, we'll be in touch real soon. Thank you. Pleasure, pal. ta yeah. man. Cheers. And a huge thank you to Stefan Jones for spending the time with us today. Guys, I mean, open, honest, candid sharing, a man sharing exactly what he's doing, what he's looking at, problems he's seeing with things going on, how we can be better, how he's manipulating his training to be better. What else could we ask for? Stefan, I cannot thank you enough for what you continue to contribute to the field to make us all be better and for being so open, honest, and candid in your sharing today. Um, I mean, just sensational stuff, guys. It, you know, please, if you haven't already, give him a follow on Instagram at StephanJones105 and check out his site, cricketstrength.com. And, and if you're sitting here saying, yeah, but it's cricket, it's cricket, it's cricket, if you can't sit here and listen to what he's talking about and transfer these ideas into what you're doing with whatever athletes you're working with, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, he's, he's breaking down things and making me look at stuff and, and talk with our coaches about some things we're doing to look at transfer and things of that nature. This, this was sensational. So, Stefan, can't thank you enough, brother. Keep up the great work. Truly appreciate everything you're doing. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. We are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.